Welcome to this week's virtual drasha. This week we have the incredible privilege to begin the third book of the Torah, to begin Chumash Vayikra and three Parshas Vayikra. Parshas Vayikra, like most of Chumash Vayikra, contains a voluminous amount of information regarding Karbanos, sacrificial service. So to be honest, sometimes when we get to these Parshas of Karbanos, we get to Chumash Vayikra, we tend to tune out a little bit because we feel that the details aren't so relevant. After all, we don't yet have our third base HaMikdash. Our lives don't yet center around sacrificial service. So the truth is, sometimes I feel kind of like, what's in it for me? What's the lesson? But the beauty of our Torah is that every single Pasuk possesses contemporary meaning and relevance. Sometimes the meaning and relevance is a bit more obvious, and sometimes we have to pierce beneath the surface a little bit, but there's always a lesson, there's always a moral, there's always a theme, there's always an idea to be extracted and is there to enrich our lives. I want to show you something amazing. The Pasuk says, this is in Perak Beis, Pasuk Yud Gimel, chapter 2, verse 13, the Torah writes, V'chol karban minchascha b'melech timlach. Literally, again, you should put salt on every one of your karbanos. Literally, do not negate or do not forget the covenant of salt from your mincha, from your meal offering. You have an obligation to place salt on every single karban. It's a halacha that we're familiar with. In fact, the Rambam writes that if one forgets to go ahead and add salt to a carbon, the sacrifice, the offering, is actually invalid. Rashi is intrigued by this idea that the Torah doesn't just simply tell me to put salt or add salt to every carbon, but the Torah calls salt a bris melach. There's a salt covenant, or there's a covenant of salt. And Rashi HaKadosh says, what's the covenant of salt? What's the bris? In other words, you want to tell me you have to add, you have to add salt, you have to add melach? Okay, I understand you have to add salt. But what does it mean that there's a covenant with salt? And Rashi says something so beautiful. Rashi says, Shabris krusa lemelach misheshis imibreshis. There was a covenant which God made with salt during the six days of creation. This covenant goes all the way back to the beginning of time, specifically when HaKadosh Baruch Hu created the Rakia. Before the Rebbe Hashem created the Rakia, the sky divided the sky. So there were waters, and there were celestial waters and earthly waters, but it was kind of one body of water. And then when HaKadosh Baruch Hu created the sky, the Rakia, the sky, the job of the sky was to divide between the Maim al and the Maim Tachtonim, the upper waters and the lower waters, the celestial waters and the earthly waters. And the earthly waters were so sad, were so heartbroken, were so crestfallen, that they were going to be cut off and removed and so the Ribbono Shal Olam seeks to calm the earthly waters by telling them, don't worry, you are not cut off, you're not removed. You will serve a sensual role in sacrificial service because you can't offer up anything on the altar. You can't offer up any carbon without salt. And the salt, of course, comes from the oceans. And as such, this is the bris, this is the covenant that HaKadosh Baruch Hu made with the earthly waters that although the Rakia divides, the earthly waters and the heavenly celestial waters, the earthly waters will find their way to come close, to connect with HaKadosh Baruch Hu through the Karbanos. That as the Karbanos ascend from the altar to the Ribbono Shal Olam, no carbon can ascend without the addition of salt. But if we try to understand this on even on a little bit of a deeper level, it behooves us to examine a little bit of the nature of salt. And to do that, we're going to go back a little bit, back into Chumash Bereshis, with a dramatic story. And it's the story of the escape of Lot and his family from Stom. We know the story. The city of Stom, the Torah tells us, are in the time of the incredibly evil people. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu decreed that the cities of Stom and the surrounding cities were going to be destroyed. But Lot, together with his family, were going to be saved in the merit of Avram Avinu. And so the Malachim, the angels, come to Stom, making a long story short, and they say to Lot, we're here to save you. Gather up your wife, gather up your family. Only two of Lot's daughters agreed to come. He had two other married daughters who would not join him. And Lot, his wife, and his two daughters flee from Stom. And the Malachim, the angels, Give Lot and his family one simple instruction. Don't look back. Atabet me'achorov, don't look back. You're not allowed to look back. If you look back, it's going to be the end. So the Torah tells us what happens. The Torah tells us, this is in Bereshit's Parak Yotas Pasach of Beis, chapter 19, verse 22. Vatabet ishto me'achorov. Lot's wife looked back. Vatehi nitziv melach. And she became a pillar of salt. And the question is obvious. Why did she become a pillar of salt? Or in other words, you want to tell me that she defied the Malachim so she died, or something else happened. 
But why did she become a pillar of salt? And I want to share with you two approaches. The first is the approach of the Aznaim Latora. The Aznaim Latora says, some of Suratskin explains very beautifully. He says, we know Rashi already highlights that when Lot invited the guests, he didn't know they were Malachim, he thought they were just men, and he invited them into his home. So Rashi records an exchange between Lot and his wife. And Lot says to his wife, I brought, up, I brought home guests, and his wife was all upset. And he said, listen, I know we don't share common convictions regarding hachnasas or hospitality, but they're here. Could we please just serve them a meal? So she brings out bread. And then he asked her, says the according to Medrash, he asked her for salt. And she said, salt? Salt? Now you want to introduce this practice? It's not enough that you brought home guests. That was bad enough. It's not enough that you want to serve them bread. But now you want to add salt? So the Aznaim Torah says, what was the point of contention between Lot and his wife, right? Every, every good husband knows. There's only so far you push. So if you already pushed your luck with bringing the guests home, and you already pushed your luck ultimately again with, with giving them bread, why don't you just let the salt go? And the Aznaim Torah says something so beautiful. Salt provides flavor. Salt provides flavor. See, what Lot said was, if we're going to give them bread, let's make it flavorful. If we're going to give them bread, if we're going to do the mitzvah, we're going to do achnas as archim. Let's do it right. And let's do it in a way not just to get by. Let's do it in a way not just to check the box. If you're already going to give them bread, if we're already putting ourselves and our family in peril by going against the rules of storm and inviting, inviting guests, so let's just give them the salt, make it flavorful, make it beautiful, go above and beyond to perform the mitzvah in the right way. And his wife said, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? I have no interest in that. And therefore, ultimately, again, in a quid pro quo, in a mida kineged mida, when she defies the instructions of the malachim and she looks back, her punishment is to turn into salt. But the Lala of Rebbe says something a little bit different. The Lala of Rebbe explains so beautifully that if you look, if you look at the wording, when, when the malachim, when the angels were gathering up Lot and his family to go, so the Pasuk says, Vayismama says that Lot, everyone, they tarried. And there's a shalshelas, which is the trup, the cantillation sign that goes back and forth. Vayis, mama, ah, ah, ah. We go up and down three times, representing the idea that even Lot was torn as to whether or not he could actually leave stone. And the Lala Rebbe says something amazing. He says that when the Malachim said to Lot and his family, you're leaving stone, he was telling them, you have to make a break with this past. You have to make a break with stone. Don't look back. Because if you look back, that shows that you're still attached. If you look back, then ultimately, again, it shows that you're still rooted there. If you look back, it shows that you're not committed to a new beginning. And what happens? Lot's wife looks back and she turns into a pillar of salt. Why a pillar of salt? The Lala of Rebbe explains so beautifully. Because salt is a preservative. Salt is a preservative. What salt does is it takes something and it preserves it forever, so to speak, in its present state. Once you salt something, that item is stymied. It cannot grow. It cannot change. It's preserved, so it stays the way it is for who knows how long, but it cannot evolve. It cannot become anything different. And therefore, says the Lala Rebbe so beautifully, do you know why the wife of Lot became a pillar of salt? Because it was representative of the fact that she was unwilling to change. She was unwilling to evolve. The Malachim said, we're giving you an opportunity for a new start, for a new beginning. You are living in a decadent, depraved society. And yes, it's not through your merit you're being saved. It's through the merit of Abraham Avinu. But you are getting a new chance, a new lease on life. But all you have to do is shut the door on stone and open the door on something new. You can't look back. You need to move forward. But the wife of Lot was unable to shut the door on her past. She was unable to close out that chapter. She was salt. She was preserved. She was stuck where she was and unable to evolve, unable to transcend. And so it turns out that according to the Lala Rebbe, salt, the power of salt, is that it's a preservative. It's a preservative. And if we kind of bring these two messages together, we begin to appreciate the totality of salt. On one hand, salt represents growth, like the Aznaim Torah, more flavor, do more, be more. But salt is a preservative, and a preservative could also represent consistency. 
Growth and consistency. This is the power of salt. Amazingly enough, all learned out from the wife of Lot. She turns into a pillar of salt because unfortunately for her, she wanted to be consistent. She just wanted to stay where she was. She didn't want to leave stone. And so as such, she turned into a pillar of preservative. She turned into a pillar of salt. According to Aznayim Latora, she turned into salt because she didn't want to grow. She didn't want to grow. She didn't want to add extra flavor. She didn't want to do anything else. Which, and you see, they're kind of both focusing on two sides of the same coin. And perhaps this is the meaning of the Pasek. When the Torah tells us in this week's parasha, V'chol karbancha minchascha b'melech timlach, al kol karbancha takriv melech, what is the covenant of salt? Perhaps what HaKadosh Baruch Hu is trying to teach us is such an incredible lesson. And it's the lesson of successful spirituality. You want to have a meaningful Yiddishkeit. You want to have a meaningful relationship with Hashem. You want to have a meaningful relationship with your people, with yourself. Then you must create the bris melech then you must create the covenant of salt. Because remember, the Torah, the word karban, we know we translate it as sacrifice. But the word karban actually means karov, to come close. If you want to come close to Hashem, if you want to come close to your nation, if you want to come close to yourself, it requires a bris melach. It requires a covenant of salt. And the covenant of salt possesses this duality. Number one, to be a preservative consistency. You know, on one hand, none of us is really ever fully consistent. But yet at the same time, we have to strive for consistency. This is the interesting dialectic of the Jew. I know that the, my greatest struggle is being consistent, but yet I'm still going to strive for consistency. It sounds like a contradiction, but we're Jewish. That's okay. We're a people of contradictions because you recognize that the human condition is a series of contradictions. Consistency is my Achilles heel, yet it's the very thing that I strive for most. Bruce Malach teaches us to try to be consistent. You know, it's easy for a person to go ahead and feel inspired or to shine spiritually bright episodically. Here, there, Yamim Nora, I'm on a Pesach Seder, and this. But so much of success in Yiddishkeit is consistency. And sometimes to be consistent, it means you're not always inspired. I wish I could say that every shachris I davened, mamish moved my soul. To be very honest, most times I daven, it doesn't move my soul. And not because davening is not moving, but just because I'm probably distracted or probably not paying enough attention. But even if the tefillah is not exactly as it should be, I'm not going to miss a davening. I'm not going to miss a tefillah. Because ultimately, again, the bris melach, the covenant of salt says, I have to be consistent because consistency is the bedrock of every relationship. Can you imagine? I've given this mushal before. Can you imagine you're in a marriage? Well, you don't have to, if you're in a marriage, you don't have to imagine. But you're in a marriage and you say to your spouse, you know what, my love, here's the deal. I'm going to be the best husband on Sundays, Tuesdays, alternate Fridays. But you know, I also need me time. I need me time, so I'm sorry, those other times I'm, I'm, I'm checked out, I'm checked out. So good luck with sustaining such a relationship like that. Same thing with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. My goal is to be consistent. My goal is to show up every day. My goal is to be there. Some days are better than others. Some days are inspirational and some are not. But the Bris Melech, the covenant of soul, teaches me the need for consistency. But the Bris Melech also teaches me salt adds flavor. Flavor represents not just getting by, but flavor represents growth. Flavor represents an extra added dimension, an extra added dynamic. The bris melach teaches me consistency is great, but sometimes a person remains so consistent that they don't grow. I have to be consistent, but I also have to build in an element of growth into my life each and every day. The Ribbono Sholem tells us that it's not only the type of sacrifices that go on the altar which ultimately require melech, which requires salt. But it's the karban, it's the kirva, it's the closeness that each of us try to affect each and every day, which requires the covenant of salt as well. The covenant of consistency, the covenant of growth, each and every day. Let us hope that Amir Hashem, the day will come where we will be zoche to offer up our kabanos in our third base, Amikdash Mehira Amenu. But until that day, let us offer up the covenant of salt on our altar of personalistic service each and every day. Wishing everyone a good Erev Shabbos and a beautiful Shabbos Kodesh.